Hey everyone, my name is Aspen Dudzik and I am your host for Forestry Talks, a podcast that explores all things forestry in Alberta. I'm here today at the beautiful Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge in Jasper, Alberta, and we're here to celebrate our annual general meeting and conference for the Alberta Forest Products Association. I've got some great guests that are gonna join me for the show this week. You're gonna love them. I can't wait to share them with you. Hey folks, we're back with another episode of Forestry Talks. I'm super thrilled to be joined by James Rajat, pardon me, Alberta's Senior Representative to the U.S. James, how are you doing this morning? Good, very good. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, and you gave a, a presentation to uh, to the industry and everybody that was here yesterday. Can you tell me a little bit about um, how that went and, and some of the big questions that came up? I thought it went quite well. It's really sort of explaining the, the role that I have and the role that the offices have in the United States. I don't know if many people realize Alberta's involvement in the U.S. in a formal way. We've actually had an office as a province since 2004, 2005. Mm -hmm. Premier Klein set it up right in the Canadian Embassy. And so we share sort of office space with the province of Ontario. So this has been a long-standing presence in the U.S., and then recently, because of the size of the relationship we have, we have 160 billion of bilateral trade between Alberta and the United States. Typically, we're the second largest trading province with the U.S., but last year wow. we were actually number one in 2022. So go for us. Like to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we like to be very positive about that. Um, but we've decided as a government to expand our presence in the U.S. So we've gone from what we had was a couple of years ago was two people in, in the Washington office in D.C., We've opened offices in Seattle, Chicago, and Dallas. We're going to have two people in each of those offices to expand our presence as well as increase the number in DC to five. So moving up to a complement and trying to cover all the regions to not only protect market access for essential products like our forest products, mm -hmm. but also to build on that and enhance that trade to ensure that we are you know, maximizing our relationship with the US and with all of its regions. Yeah, absolutely. That's very exciting. Sounds like there's lots of big new changes that are yeah, coming through yeah. and really expanding our presence there. What are some of the big priorities for you? Well, the big priorities, I sort of simplify our role in terms of obviously advocacy on some key issues and then business development and trade and then investment. And the third big area investment is really the purview of Invest Alberta Corporation. So if there's a company that wants to invest a lot in Alberta, obviously we welcome that. Invest Alberta works with all of our departments, the industries here sort of facilitate that on advocacy this could be hundreds of issues right. and obviously within your industry you know very well things like softwood lumber deforestation in the states and this is an important point as well it's not only at the national level it's at the state and local level as well mm -hmm. that we engage but on the agriculture side country of origin labeling legislation again both national state level uh things <laughs> in ensuring market access for our beef products obviously we send a lot of beef to the united states includes facilitation at say at the border and, and ensuring that we have adequate resources there to ensure markets get across and then energy energy infrastructure climate environmental policy those are massive because of the amount of trade that we have in those areas so obviously things like pipelines are very important mm -hmm. as well and then on the business development and trade side that's really looking for where we, can we build on those in our traditional areas say like forestry software lumber can we expand our our products and in fact alberta as a province has increased our exports to the United States, I think more than any other province. But in areas like technology, in areas like film and television, uh, the entire season of The Last of Us was actually filmed in Alberta. Mm -hmm. And I love telling American audiences that <laughs> and saying, we can do more with you in this area. And they're like, oh, that's fantastic. I didn't realize that. Um, certain sections of Alberta have actually, I think, received more awards from a visual point of view than any other region in the, in the world. So this really? is something we should really sort of brag about, talk about, and then see if we can expand our business engagement there. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's great, James, where we get to have people like you who your job is to brag about Alberta, right? Yeah, it's the best job. It's like, <laughs> you know, go to various parts of the United States and talk about Alberta and talk about the great things that are happening here and the ways that we want to engage with them and maximize it. Yeah. What are some of the, I guess, big questions that you get when you're you're on your tour talking to people about our province? Big questions or surprises? Yeah, it's it's fascinating because a lot of it, if, when we're at the national level, a lot of people will look at us and say, like, why is Alberta engaging nationally? Obviously, mm. we work with our Canadian partners with other provinces, but why is Alberta here? Obviously, because of the importance with the United States. 
we export more as a percentage to the United States and other provinces. So we're very mm -hmm. dependent on that relationship, but also because of our own Canadian constitution, it allocates jurisdiction over natural resources, for instance, to the provinces. That's very important for forestry sector, very important for the energy sector. So we want to ensure that we have protection for that market access. And in fact, the reason that the office was originally open, as I understand it by Premier Klein, was over an agriculture issue, was over BSE. A lot of people presume it's another issue. But there are issues in which we obviously work with our Canadian partners. They work very hard on issues like you know, North American integrated market, uh, countering by American movements in the United States. Mm -hmm. But we feel as a province, we need to add to that and amplify that. But obviously, in certain areas, we may have a perspective that may not exactly be in sync with the federal government. We need to make sure that we make those views known, but obviously ensure that people in the United States are aware of the opportunities here in this province. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so important. Um, you've touched a little bit on, on exports so far and, uh, and softwood lumber. And so I'm wondering, I mean, I, I want to get into the softwood lumber issue for you, but for or I would like to get into the softwood lumber issue with you. Um, but for those that don't have a ton of context about that in general, do you mind giving us some background about the softwood lumber um, disputes that are going on? So the softwood lumber dispute could be the longest, most challenging perennial issue we can count in the United States. Um, and I was in federal politics before, and our government had actually signed a softwood lumber grant back in 2006. And at that time, I think President Bush at the time said, he was so tired of hearing about it from Prime Minister Harper. He just wanted the issue resolved. And obviously because of our close links, not only in economic matters, but military matters as well in areas like Afghanistan. But it is probably the, the most, if not one of the most challenging areas between Canada and the United States. A lot of people in the U.S. who are obviously in that industry, they argue that we in our provinces in the Canadian uh, industry, we do not value sort of our softwood lumber materials properly. And we believe, they believe that we subsidize it, which obviously we say is actually completely factually incorrect. Mm -hmm. So there's a really fundamental issue there between a lot of the producers in the United States and the industry here in Canada. So what we have to do is continually argue, and that's why we as Canada want very much a rules-based system. We want these panels where we can argue that, no, those arguments are in fact completely factually incorrect. Uh, we do value our, our softwood lumber material properly. And in fact, American consumers love Canadian softwood lumber. They need it to build the homes. They need it to address issues like housing costs and that. So it is entirely not only in our interest, it is in Americans' interest to have Canadian softwood lumber at, we would argue, increased levels to keep those housing prices mm -hmm. reasonable for their own citizens. Yeah. And uh, so from what I understand it, a, a big part of where this dispute comes from is that in America, a lot of the land where, where forestry activity occurs is private, yeah. whereas in Canada, for the most part, it's uh, it's crown land. It's and so there's land. a little bit of a difference between how we're accessing that fiber. Um, in Canada, we pay, of course, as you know, the stumpage fees, it's stumpage yep. dues to be able exactly. to access that land, to be able to manage it holistically for all of its values. But it's a different story in the U.S. And so a lot of these tariffs are coming out of a misunderstanding about the way that we manage the land differently. That is exactly correct. That's a, a fantastic way of, of explaining it as well in the sense of, and this is a very big difference between Canada and the United States. So when I'm down there, we'll say, first of all, provinces have jurisdiction over natural resources under the Canadian constitution. And so Americans will say that's very different, especially in the Western US, where some states have very high percentage federal land in their states. And that's obviously uh, controlled by the federal government. But even beyond that, the, the notion of crown land, you have to actually explain this to U.S. policymakers. They look at you and they say, crown, like, what's a crown land? Oh. And obviously, you, you explain sort of the history of that. So the fact that a province like Alberta with 60% you know, plus crown land is a very different situation, especially for the forestry sector, but for other sectors as well in terms of the management of that and in terms of ensuring the sustainability of the forest going forward. So it's a very different system. But we are very open. In fact, I think we had the Department of Commerce here in Alberta this, this summer to say, look, this is how we value stumpage fees. This is how we, we value our products. Uh, we're being very open about that. And so we still argue that even though it's different systems, we properly value the products that we're sending to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that education is so important because yeah. what we're seeing right now is, is these tariffs that are being added to Canadian 
forest products, softwood lumber products when they're coming to the States. And you touched a little bit about how that also harms Americans, right? Like I think for us or um, Albertans, we might really be thinking about, well, you know, this is unfair because it's inhibiting our ability to be competitive in the market. But it's it's kind of on both sides of the border, there are some negative impacts. Can you talk a little bit about that? You're exactly right. And in fact, if you look at the tariffs, so, so it's roughly $8 billion of tariffs. So obviously this is being applied. It's set aside now. I mean, hopefully there'll be a resol- resolution at some point where there's an allocation of those tariffs. But it is increasing prices then that go into the American market. And this is obviously one of the biggest concerns of Americans recently is cost of living, is inflation mm-hmm. for products like food, for products like uh, gasoline or, or heating their homes or cooling their homes. But for housing itself, that is a major concern in the United States. And so the Home Builders Association is a very good ally of ours to say that, no, we want Canadian lumber down. It's reasonably priced. It's fairly priced. But we need more of their product down to ensure that we have that supply to keep housing affordable for Americans. So they're one of our main allies in terms of arguing with key U.S. policymakers that the current system is unjust and tying this up in sort of panels, like we're on our fourth panel, the legal process continuing. Mm -hmm. In fact, even this week in Washington, we had people from our forestry department reviewing these panels and we have our lawyers down in D.C. as well. But this is not the way that two countries, especially the way that we trade in our historical trading relationship. And to your point, our reasonably priced lumber benefits Americans to a huge extent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and you touched a little bit about how um, this has been a, an ongoing review yeah. or this has been one of the biggest challenges. Can yeah. you give us like a really quick drive by of, of the history of softwood lumber and how long this has actually been going on over the last however many years? <laughs> well, this, is, this has been, I would say decades. So this yeah. is just a very long standing perennial dispute. Again, uh, when they had the agreement in 2006 between the governments at the time, this did sort of, you know, at that time. So it settled the issue for a period and then that was extended. But it is always sort of been percolating in the background. And it's been percolating because you have U.S. interests who approach their representatives. And even though you have the home builders on one side arguing Mm -hmm. that U.S. policymakers should, in fact, facilitate these products, you have a lot of influential people on the other side who argue it's unfair mainly to protect their market share and so it has been a, a long-standing dispute i think i think most trade policy experts would say it's the most sort of sizable trade era to in over the last number of decades yeah yeah no doubt and we can start to hear some of the some of the chit chatter yeah, as everybody's yeah. rolling out here because we are recording of course at a conference so that's that's always a lot of fun um james before we move on from softwood lumber i'm just wondering if you have any insight to um how things might unfold moving forward i know of course there's lots of work with our uh, our, par- our federal partners to advocate on yeah. this issue do you have any kind of early indication or, or sense about how things might unfold over the next while so the federal partners, so the federal government has been very active and sort of at every step, obviously opposing what the administration is doing and also encouraging the administration to sort of put people on the panels who are fair and, and reasonable and balanced to decide on these issues. Um, you know, it's been very, very frustrating for them as it has been for us in the sense of the lack of response from the U.S. administration. And it is something for us we have to be very cognizant of, which is this is one of the issues in which one of the few issues that in our perception is that the Biden administration has essentially the same view as the Trump administration Mm. is it's very sort of not open to sort of discussions with us in terms of negotiation, but also in terms of actually just properly staffing these panels so that we can make some progress and move forward. So we don't currently have a lot of political allies in the United States. And I think viewers need to sort of hear that and understand that is because a lot of people may be asking, well, why don't they start these negotiations? And the reality is that's something that we're obviously talking to the industry about on a regular basis is, is this the time to sort of agitate? Obviously, we do everything we can on a legal Mm. basis, um, but we don't have a lot of leverage with sort of the political leadership in the United States, as I mentioned, the administration, whether it was the Trump administration, the Biden administration, is not, like they're just not open to a discussion on this issue in a reasonable way. And then at the political level within the Congress itself, then you have a lot of strong interests that are supporting key senators who 
are not frankly open again to the Canadian position on this. So we really need to do our political work, which we've mm -hmm. been doing, and then obviously working with the uh, Canadian government, but we also work very closely with other provinces in terms of when is the best time and what's the best way to engage. Is it continuing with the legal process, obviously political pressure, but at what time do we sort of start active negotiations? I think that's still up for discussions between ourselves and the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I look forward to, to seeing more how this unfolds. And, yeah. and James, we really appreciate uh, your work on this important Thank file. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. Um, we mentioned a little bit earlier some talk about those do not buy campaigns coming out of the States. Can you chat a little bit about that? So we had initiatives out of both uh, New York and California, sort of deforestation. And when essentially they said, just to simplify it, is if, you know, countries are harvesting out of certain types of forests, old growth forests, that then there would be provisions put in place by those states to sort of counter and launch, you know, sort of actions against those, again, in our case, provinces of the country exporting products into those states. Now, it, it targeted a lot of the forests, uh, you know, in South America and elsewhere, China, but then they included the boreal forest in here. Mm -hmm. And I would say very candidly, I think there was just a lack of information in terms of what all the boreal forest included and the fact that Canada and Canadian provinces were included in this legislation. So we engaged with uh, obviously the industry, raised it as a concern. We engaged with the other provinces, so ourselves, uh, Quebec, Ontario, British Columbia, and with the Canadian government and the, in the consulates in those two areas in New York and in California, very actively engaged with both the members of the Senate and the assembly who had brought these bills forward and in, in New York, we were successful in uh, in stopping the legislation. We understand that the senator who brought it forward originally, she may bring forward that issue again. In California, we were successful in amending the legislation twice, and then Governor Newsom in the end vetoed it. Because we did make the arguments that, in terms of our certification mm -hmm. of the Canadian provinces is higher, much higher, frankly, than what the U.S. has in their states. Uh, and, and, and in terms of globally, we have very high standards in terms of certification in excess of 80% here in Alberta, um, but also being very open and transparent in terms of how we manage our forests. So to your earlier point about crown lands yep. and the, the province is the steward of these resources, and here's how they manage it. And this is why you may have to harvest old growth forests in Alberta because of an issue like the mountain pine beetle, something that, I mean, to be very candid, they just didn't know it all because mm -hmm. they've not experienced that but as you know being in alberta or british columbia that had a huge impact on our industry and on our forests here or something like wildfires which unfortunately we had a very uh, hard summer in terms yep. of wildfires but in terms of you know the province and the industry needing to manage the forest so it's best to protect the forest and then to manage it going forward and as you know people in these rooms here today they look at it from a hundred or two hundred year framework, right? Mm -hmm. These are, they're planning for us for two generations uh, forward, right? Which is a, a fantastic way of looking at it. So once we made all this information available, then people are like, actually, we did not mean to target Canada or Alberta yeah. at all. So that's why they were open to amending their legislation. And in the end, the legislation did not move forward. So we're very we're very cognizant of those states, but also looking at other states because we feel it may pop up elsewhere. Yeah, well, I mean, again, we appreciate your work on that file. It was yeah. certainly discouraging um, to see when those bills came out and, yeah. and then that Canada was included in it, but encouraging to hear about how the, the amendments were made and there is a little bit of an understanding. I think a big part of uh, where that comes from really is to your point, a lack of education or a lack of understanding about what forestry actually looks like in Canada. A lot of the times when we think of old growth, we're envisioning these, you know, thousand year old cedars on the coast and, in, Al in Alberta, we frankly don't have that. Your, you know, your mature forests are going to be 100, 150 year old at most, you know, in, in, in yeah. a typical uh, boreal setting. So it is kind of an, a misunderstanding about that. And then the deforestation aspect. I mean, you know, if you want to talk deforestation in Canada, that's road building and urbanization. Forestry isn't a business if it's deforestation, right? That's going out into the forest, chopping everything down, and then calling it a day and saying, well, I don't have a job anymore because the forest is gone. <laughs> well, it's very good points. And, and yeah, you're right, because when you're in California and you think deforestation of old growth, you think, well, the redwoods, like, why would they cut the redwoods down? It's like, no, that's not, that's not the situation of the boreal forest, as you mentioned. And that's not how we manage the forest either. Yeah. Um, and so that's 
yeah, once we made those points and explained those points, and that's where, I mean, the industry is very helpful in that in terms of providing information. But we, you know, we had the forest, our forestry department here in Alberta is excellent. And so we had a key policy expert like, actually, we need you to come to New York to sit down with the senator who has the legislation and explain to her kind of the details of how we manage our forests. And so we did that. And, and frankly, she's like, oh, I didn't know any of this information, mm -hmm. right? It was just, you know, and this is how, some, you know, a lot of in, in Canada, when the parliamentary system is very different from the system they have in the U.S., so you will have hundreds of bills introduced in the U.S. sometimes within a month or two. And there's just such a volume of bills that, let's just be candid, the people who, like, is every member of the Senate, every member of the Assembly at a state level reading every single piece of legislation. And that's why you have to become active to say, no, you're actually passing forward a bill. You may think it's benign. You think it's mm -hmm. very, you know, pro-progressive and environmental standpoint, but you're actually sort of what you're intending in this bill is actually doing counter to what you yeah. intended to do. In incredibly harmful to a business that is stewards of yeah. of the forest and, yeah. and sustainably managing it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like, like a good example, a good point of that is, imagine if you'd said you cannot harvest any um, trees to protect it from the mountain pine beetle. Yeah. Like if you'd said to Northern Alberta, Northern BC, you can't take any action against that. I, I mean, imagine the devastation that would have been wrought. Yeah. It, I mean, the devastation wrought anyways was tremendous, but uh, terrible, but in terms of what could have happened if the if the industry had not been able to deal with that and the provinces had not been able to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, you know, BC, their forests were absolutely decimated. Yeah. In Alberta, we were certainly no stranger to the impacts of the mountain yeah. pine beetle, but the boreal stretches all across Canada. This could have been, yeah. you know, the entire nation's problem. Exactly. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a great point. I'm glad you bring that yeah. up about the preventative action that was taken to, to mitigate for those risks. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so we'll keep keep an eye on that and obviously watch for that. And I think the other thing to be mindful, maybe the final point is this legislation, in our view, would have impacted other industries as well. So not just forest products, yeah. but products that actually come from the boreal region. So that's something where the agricultural community, the energy community as well, sort of needed to be very cognizant of, of that legislation possibly moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got one last question for sure. you, James, before we wrap up. I'm curious, what are some of the trends that you're hearing in D.C.? And, and with this, you know, an, an election that's coming up on the horizon, what what do Albertans need to know? Well, yeah, and it's it's been interesting this weekend because a lot of Albertans, a lot of Canadians follow U.S. politics very acutely. Um, so obviously, it's, it's a very partisan environment, uh, both at the national and state levels. Um, you've got an ongoing Republican presidential campaign, so we had the, the second debate this week. But we have a situation where the government may actually shut down on Saturday. So you have Speaker McCarthy on the Republican side, who took 17, 18 votes for him to actually get the speakership. But he has a very, very tight majority, and then he has a number of members of, of his own caucus, 8 to 10 members who clearly want the government to shut down to sort of make their point, whether it's on his leadership or whether it's on government spending or both. Um, so it's a very sort of tenuous situation. Uh, the Senate is doing what it's can to sort of try to pass as many bills to at least get whether it's continuing resolutions, which just keeps the government operating for a certain period of time. But obviously there's, there's some real political fractures in the United States, both between the parties and within the parties. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very challenging political environment for them. It's challenging for us, so Albertans as Canadians as engaging in that as we have to watch. Obviously, we want to engage with both parties. We want policies to benefit our province, regardless of who's in power, yeah. either in the administration or in Congress. And so we try to craft as much and explain to them how, again, we're a very integrated market. We build things together. We're very interdependent, both from an economic but a military security point of view. And so we need to very much work together and not get caught in sort of the political friction between the parties. But it's it's very interesting for us to watch as uh, we'll see if, whether the government shuts down and then going forward into the 2024 presidential election. But it's just there's so much uh, so much tension and angst right now in, in American politics that obviously from a diplomatic point of view, we would help. We would hope there's, they find some sort of way to sort of settle that down and and find perhaps more issues in which they can agree on in a bipartisan way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, James, thank you so much. This thank has you. been really wonderful. Thank I'm you. thrilled you were able to join us at the conference this year and to give a great presentation to uh, to our attendees yesterday. Yeah. And uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap? No, just thank you so much. I, this has been, yeah, fantastic. I really enjoy our conversation. And uh, just maybe for you, but for obviously really enjoyed uh, the Alberta Forest Product Association. We've had very good relations with them, with the industry. But again, our offices are Alberta's offices. So if people want to reach out to us, please feel free to do so and give us their advice, their guidance, or if they want to expand business development trade in the United States, or if they, a lot of people even just want to come down and visit and see what's going on in the embassy or wherever, it's, we're certainly happy to welcome that because we are Alberta's offices in the U.S. Awesome. Well, we so appreciate it, James. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining me for another episode of Forestry Talks, a podcast that explores all things forestry in Alberta. We've got some more great guests lined up for our AGM this week. Stay tuned for more. And if you're curious to learn even more about forestry in Alberta, check out our website, loveabforest.ca. I'm your host, Aspen Dudzik, and I'll see you next time. This series is proudly produced by the team at Road 55. Road 55 creates content that connects. For more information, check our website, www.road55.ca.